Hi everyone, I'm Anita Yori, a research assistant and scientific supervisor at Berlin University of the Arts. And I'm going to moderate this third section or third module of the Research Networking Day. And I'm super happy to be part of this uh, research program or like Research Networking Day. And I'm also really happy that Dalia invited me. So thank you so much and for the whole CTM team, especially that I can moderate the third session, which is for me or my, in my opinion, a very important one because we will discuss a couple of gender related and uh, female identified musicians related uh, topics. So I really hope that you will all enjoy it. And as, as a start, because I'm the uh, moderator of this uh, session, I will give you just a really short kind of presentation, like something uh, to kick off this whole topic, and then I will give the word to the presenters, and they will have 10 minutes to present and five minutes for the discussion. So, a lot of things happened and have happened in research since Tara Rogers published her milestone book, Pink Noises, Women in Electronic Music and Sound in 2010, a powerful testimony to the presence and vitality of women in electronic music cultures. Since then, many academic conferences and events have been organized that focused on questions related to female-identified artists and protagonists in electronic music, sonic arts, and sound studies. Just to mention some of them, for example, the symposium and event series Her, no Her Noise, Feminisms and the Sonic Act at Tate Modern London in 2012, and its follow-up symposium Sound, Gender, Feminism, Activism, or another conference Women in Sound, Women on Sound at Goldsmiths University in 2016. Also, a great amount of scientific papers were published, including, for example, the book Beyond the Dance Floor, Female DJs, Technology and Electronic Dance Music by Rebecca Ferrugia in 2012, or even the journal Dance Cult has recently dedicated a whole issue for the topic with the title Women in Electronic Dance Music Culture. Scholars have also realized that not only the history of women in electronic music is a black hole of no information, as Anna Lockwood, Lockwood sorry, put in an interview, but also the research methodologies are sometimes problematic. Um, the ways, let's say, so to say, the ways how we try to analyze the subject of women in electronic music. For example, the second presenter of this section, Odgo Langroa, will question the perception of the gendered voice, or the first presenter, Jillian Sellner, will highlight another problematic research issue, our often limited European or North American point of view. Last but not least, the third presenter, Christina Rus, will question the actual cultural studies trends of space as a fluid and dynamic concept. At the German Association for Music Business and Music Culture Research, where I'm the first person like, who's leading, let's say, this association, we thought that these questions are highly related to empowerment. Who gets access, power, and who is rejected or, and powerless? Or with other words, who is privileged or who is not? To discuss this theme on a bit wider scale, we also gave the title to our upcoming yearbook, Music and Empowerment, with a particular interest in the connection between music, economics, and empowerment itself. We understand empowerment as a possibility of becoming visible and empowering marginalized groups or groups with almost no power. More generally, we wanted to examine the different questions of power and exclusion in music cultures and music markets. This, of course, also touches the here discussed to uh, gender-related topics and diversity. The best proof of it is that from the 12 papers, which will be included in the volume, seven discuss gender-related questions, of course, also including gender, queer, or non-binary and genders. So nowadays, we see a tendency of new wave and probably generation of scholars who have become highly interested, interested in rewriting or adding to the histories of sound and electronic music. The three presenters of this module also belong to these academics. They are discussing very different topics from also very different point of views of research aspects, but there's only one very important common uh, character of their presentation, namely that they are all talking about, or at least touching the importance of presence of discussing around the earlier mentioned research interests. So, women in electronic music, let's say. 
Also, as already mentioned, um, Gillian Sanner will emphasize the possibilities and limitations of research methodologies from a European or North American perspective on Middle Eastern region. To do so, she will present her uh, creative collaboration with women sound artists in the Middle Eastern region. Odgo Langlois will question the per perception of the gendered voice in the in the field of performance. She will discuss how parts of Western society influence the human experience of one's voice. She will argue that female and male markers are merely constructions that aim to control the voice and fit it into certain structures, so-called gender norms, and that we shouldn't under underestimate the power of the voice to transcend them. Finally, based on ethnographic research and interviews with female musicians and sound artists from Mexico, Catarina Ruiz will demonstrate how women in this region express their own voice with constant performances in an international field of alternative or electronic or experimental music. So I'm really looking forward to all the discussions what we are going to have today about these three kind of different topics, but as mentioned, there is only one thing which is really present in these three topics or like the presentations. And first of all, I'd like to um, give uh, the, the microphone to Gillian to take it over, but I will tell us just some words about your work or what you are doing. So Gillian Selner is a UK-based Canadian sound artist beginning a PhD with the working title Performing Agency, Women, Networks and Experimental Music and Sound in Cairo, Tehran and Beirut. Her research explores electroacoustic experimental music and sonic arts made by women in, in or born in the Middle East in an attempt to understand associated challenges, strengths and networks within and outside of that region. Her presentation's title is Researching Women Making Experimental Music and Sound Arts in the Middle East Starting Points. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Gillian. Um, I just want to say thank you very much for having me. My research is in baby stages. I started part-time my PhD in September at Sussex University. Um, and also, it's really nice to be in Berlin, away from the BBC News at the moment, where everything is becoming very myopic. And, <laughs> and um, so that's why I actually feel really passionate about my subject, because um, the UK and obviously other countries around the world are closing down rather than opening up and it's really important to, I think, explore other people's experiences, not from a sort of colonial uh, perspective. Uh, I just wanted to say my background, um, I mean, many years ago I was a DJ and I was involved in uh, world music, uh, in quotation marks, uh, and producing uh, nights in London, it was all around sort of world music, a lot of um, Arabic music. I had a break, you know, a family break, <clears throat> did an MA in art, and then I really wanted to get back into sound, and I noticed that there was a sort of lack of networks or contacts that I could find that in, of women who were doing sort of Arabic, <clears throat> or from the, you know, uh, Middle East. Uh, and that's why I sort of came to this, um, this research. So yes, it is very beginning point, so I have more questions than answers at the moment. <clears throat> and actually, you've covered quite a lot of what I was going to say, but... Um, women and technology and music is a topic that, that has gained attention recently due, the, due to the unhealthy gender distribution. However, the focus has been primarily on the role of women in Western musical culture. Hia, which is this very pink, um, is a practice-based research project that builds bridges with Middle Eastern female composers 
in the field of experimental musics and sound art. Through composition, performance, and community building, the project will investigate the cultural and sociological situation of women composers in the Middle East. <clears throat> the project will address questions that have yet to be asked by scholars and answered using methods that balance the power relations between research and subject, researcher and subject. The project has already begun to forge bonds within and outside of the Middle East, uh, Middle Eastern musical community, and has the potential to alter academic and public perceptions of women in technology outside of the West. Projects, as you've mentioned, like Her Noise Archive and Pink Noises, seek to give voice to marginalized female voices. For example, but not limited to, uh, feminist musicologists exploring subjects like gender and noise, uh, Marie Thompson, or Holly Ingleton uh, looking at feminist performance, are almost exclusively limited to European and American subjects. My research will address, will address this lack of inquiry and knowledge and could provide a radical impact contributing in the fields of ethnomusicology, musicology, and feminist studies. The resulting performances and compositions from the project will have even broader reach outside of the academy and beyond Europe. Uh, so it's the importance in the research for me is actually more in the methodology, almost as much as the subject itself. <clears throat> the traditional roles of researcher and subject are, uh, or top-down ethnomusicological ethnomusicological methods have inherent Western biases about the other or third world women, uh, as pointed out by Mahanti. Um, further, the generalization of cultures with little in common except that they are non-European and using terms like world music is in itself an act of colonialism, subverting individual political agency. And this has been pointed out many times. So it, the idea is to find a new or some different ways to do the research. The language of musicology, particularly electronic music, uh, as Tara Rogers has also pointed out, is so irrevocably ingrained with a patriarchal Western understanding of gender and race. Inquiry outside the limits of language itself will gain new insights to this research problem. So I'm just going to <clears throat> outline some of the questions that I'm looking at, that I'm interested in looking at. Um, so how do female identifying artists in the Middle East persist in making music and sound given the political, social, economic, and cultural context in which they're working? How do they negotiate their position both locally and globally? What networking strategies do they use and to what extent is their location, gender, and race a hindrance or beneficial, in fact, in these terms. Is there a connection between experimental music and sound art practices to political, social age, say, political and social agency within this demographic for both artists and their audience? If there is a connection, to what extent do these artists use or regard their works as uh, uh, works or performances as acts of activism? Do these practices alter or reaffirm traditional women's roles, both within and outside experimental music and sound art scenes in the Middle Eastern region? And then about the methods, can, collabor can collaborative and reciprocal base practice-based approaches to research address traditional power imbalances between researcher and subjects? Can this establish a basis of trust with subjects and, or other artists? So I'm an artist as well, I'm a sound artist, so I'm working with other artists, uh, although I am also a researcher. Um, can we attempt to negate traditional power positions and hegemonic biases? Can engaging in tacit knowledge and nonverbal communication in music provide radical insights into a group of artists that are often regarded as other in scholarship. <clears throat> I hope to answer some of the questions with data from an anonymous survey 
and which I hope that when that comes up, you'll share it to everybody you know that is, you know, it's relevant to. Uh, and also dialogues with female identifying artists in and from the Middle Eastern region and, and uh, specific case studies and personal accounts dialogues. Uh, however, the bulk of the project will be researched by engaging in collaborative composition and performance, sometimes live networked, in addition to discussion and dialogue. Uh, <clears throat> the practice-based research method uh, hopes to elucidate the experiences of female artists from the Middle East, researching from within rather than about, as uh, Ellen Koskoff has pointed out. Um, by employing network performance uh, from Shelley Knotts um, talking about radical democratization, uh, collective decision making and socially focused interactions to establish a more balanced power relationship between researcher and subjects, again, i.e. other artists. In addition to this from within method, Transparency and self-reflexivity -reflex as data gatherer, analysis, an analyst, and collaborator will aim to record and undermine my own biases to help retain clarity within the findings, which I think is, uh, you know, it seems like a given, but I don't think it is. And because it's practice-based, you're always sort of engaging in a reflexive, uh, almost journaling and I think that's extremely import important to not uh, make any assumptions about the people you're working with and their point of view. Um, I hope that colleagues here will have a look at the website and Instagram and follow the progress of this research and help to circulate the survey and news as it becomes available. Uh, though this is an academic and scholarly project, it's really intended to be a reciprocal project that builds communities across huge geographical areas and that you'll join this community. And another thing I was thinking about when someone was speaking earlier uh, was also about resilience. Um, so I want to understand their persistence, but I also want to uh, understand the resilience because I think that's like a step past the, the persistence. Uh, how to, and you know, any woman that engages in sort of sound arts and DJing or mixing or whatever, it's, it's hard work to get in there, you're constantly dealing with walls and you have to be very resilient to do that. So I imagine that in other cultural contexts uh, and also coming over to Europe and trying to do that kind of stuff, it's quite challenging, so. Uh, and that's it really. Thank you so much once again, Gillian. Any questions from the audience? I cannot see any hands. I cannot see actually anything. No one? Yeah, said please. <laughs> yeah, there's a <laughs> microphone is coming. <laughs> from now on, can everyone like raise their hands up higher so I can? Well, it's not really a question. It's just b before I forget. Uh, <laughs> Maybe I forgot to send you a few things. You know there is a network of Iranian female composers. No. Then I will send you the link. Okay. <laughs> uh, diaspora and uh, non-diaspora, okay, yeah. electroacoustic, uh, modern classical, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And speaking about Egypt, there were a lot of women in, during the revolution. And a lot of them were studying with uh, Ahmed Bassioni, who is a composer who was killed during the revolution. It was very interesting because there were about 40 women in Cairo doing sound art, electroacoustic, experimental music, and so on. And then uh, that scene vanished. There are a few of them still active, like Ola Saad and uh, mm -hmm. Jacqueline George, and so on. Um, and uh, I asked them, why do you think, do you think it's, it's, it, it became like this? And uh, the answer is often, uh, yeah, well, they've got kids and yeah. a job. Same, and same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's pretty sad. <laughs> it's just a comment. It's, like, it's not a question, yeah. eh, but I yeah, wanted yeah. to say it. Well, that, I mean, that is, I am addressing those in, in the survey as well, because obviously for any woman engaging in electronic music, family, you, I mean, I was, when I was producing club nights, I was staying up till five, <laughs> you know, and coming home to three-year-olds or whatever. It just doesn't go together. And, you know, partners might not be totally happy with that either. I don't know. Um, but yeah, it's doesn't. It's not conducive. 
it's possible, but it's not conducive to have young children and, and partake in that world. No, it's difficult. Recently, I played with uh, El Sambala uh, from Cameroon, and uh, she was breastfeeding her mm. toddler during the performance. That's <laughs> awesome. It was great. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe yeah. I have them uh, just a very short question yeah. that yeah. you're not leaving left here without any questions. Um, maybe can you say, you said that it's really like the first steps in your yes. research, so you are really liking yeah. the baby steps, but maybe a little bit more about this um, practice-based thing, what you said that you, you really like aiming to, because it's mm -hmm. not only a pure academic research, yeah. but it's really like a practice-based thing that how yeah. you can imagine it, like okay. how you want to develop it. Like yeah. in the next um, at the moment, I have sort of researching ways that we can network because obviously travel is not necessarily the easiest way, especially for people in the Middle East to come to England or Europe um, for visa reasons or money or whatever. Also, I try to fly as little as possible for environmental reasons. Uh, so we are looking at networked um, uh, ideas and uh, the female laptop orchestra uh, are interested in doing something with us. Um, but that is also very uh, technically tricky with bandwidth issues and distance. And, um, but there are, there's an app uh, that one of the laptop orchestra women has, uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm blanking her name, has developed for networking sort of field recordings. So I, and because there's no, it, a delay is less uh, problematic if you're, doing a performance of various field recordings. Um, I think we will probably start with that as a sort of compositional experiment. It will be a lot of experimenting, uh, and I will plan to go there if, if it is feasible, politically feasible, and things like that, um, to work with them. But it's very much going to be, uh, uh, I won't direct it, basically. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. No one has any questions for it, and we can move to the second presentation. Thank you so much once again, Julian. <laughs> so our second presenter is uh, Odgo Langlois, who is originally from France, but uh, lives in Berlin for like eight years now. <laughs> yeah, now we know that. Um, he's a composer and musician and sound artist, as mentioned, based in Berlin, and after a bachelor in music and musicology at Paris Sorbonne, she received a master's in sound studies with distinction at Berlin University of the Arts in August 2018. Her musical projects include collaborations from indie pop to avant-garde electronic music, Ode has also written artist interviews for Berlin's Kaltblut Magazine and Polaroid Originals. Uh, her latest sonic projects combine technology, field recordings, and guitar with a strong emphasis on the mu human voice. And her presentation's title is Core Sonor. Merci. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Um, it's nice to be here, so thank you, Dalia and Anita, for inviting me here at CTM. Um, I'm old, I was born in France, but I've been based in Berlin since eight years, and uh, yeah, I was a classically uh, trained jazz guitarist and singer-songwriter, but since I moved here, I started to explore more an avant-garde side of music, and this city offered me an introduction to ele electronic music scene, that I didn't explore at all in Berlin, in Paris, sorry. It was the start of a long and winding journey that brought me to this research networking day to day. As long as I can remember, I was always been uh, fascinated by the voice. Uh, it lays in the ambivalence of uh, persistence and transition. Its sound is gone as soon as it's produced. But despite this uh, inherent fluidity, it's the sonic marker of the identity of the speaker. Who is this person speaking? What can you tell about their personality, their background, their physicality? Our voices tell us a lot about who we are. 
My, start, my studies into the voice started with a feeling that turned into a question. At one point during my musical career, I was chosen as the lead singer of a three-piece band, a project where the other members felt drawn to the sonic qualities of my voice, my lyrics, and my sensitivity to music. And as you may hear, as you may be able to hear today, I have a naturally soft voice with an airy timbre, but on many occasions, um, I felt my voice getting lost in the music, and it was not gentle, it was weak, it was not poetic, it was uncertain. So this led me to question what role does my voice play when I'm connecting to others, and um, I started this research in order to find out. Um, during the Sound Studies Master degrees at the UDK, the University of Art in Berlin, I wrote this thesis entitled Corps Sonore, which translates into sounding body. Um, or sounding bodies, that's the beauty of the French language. You don't have to choose. Um, through the course of my research, I not only discovered that there were many other women and female identified people around me that experienced the same insecurities and frustration around their voices as me, but also that there were so many other people throughout history who had sought answers to the same questions that plagued my mind. So at first I wanted to establish if the origin if the origin of uh, this, my struggle was rooted in my anatomy, if my voice was the career of my meaning through the sound that it produced, surely my anatomical gender must play a part, right? Actually, not really. It's, it's through this research that I discovered that the anatomical differences between men and women are not that big to be the only answer. It's inspired that the societal constructs around the concept of gender, its norm and its ideologies played a greater role. So I began to by trying to untangle the reasons behind my almost crippling stage fright that you can see the last remain of it. Um, it was not that I wanted to shy away from the spotlight, if anything I felt drawn to it. Sometimes my most inspired and intense experience took place while I was singing on stage or for others, but I often found it easier to play and compose for myself in a private sphere, sphere and struggled when I tried to translate this into the public area. As soon as I was being observed, the way that I connected to my voice changed. On the path to find my authentic voice, I started to explore possibilities in technology if and if there were ways to escape or transform my voice so that I could create a persona which would make me feel more comfortable to perform. Through my exploration of the electrified voice, I discovered that many of the artists that I'd been drawn to and admired, such as playing to rock or fever ray, also adopted similar manipulation or augmentation techniques. It was then that I realized that I was not alone in this struggle and if anything, I was part of a wider community of creatives and artists who sought to find the answers through technology to the same questions that I had been asking all this time. It was then that I uh, started to turn more towards private ways to capture, manipulate, and share my voice with others. And this brought me to study the current hype around podcasts and audiobooks and, of course, the long-standing traditions of voices recorded and played over radio waves. So when listening to the radio, or more specifically to a podcast, we have a very intimate setting. The voice transferred into the microphone, mostly in a radio like super close or very, in a very intimate setting, then back into your headphones and directly into your ear canal, it's also an intimate experience. And the speaker wouldn't use their voice in the same way as if they were speaking to a large audience. What was it about this private and curated experience that allowed me to feel more confident and open with my voice? And how could I find a way to translate this into a larger scale performance in real time? So it was then that this relationship came to me. It, it was still through performance, however, that chose to manifest itself that I could, in fact, influence the discourse itself and create my own 
personal act of resistance that started to break out from those constraints that had been opposed upon me. So then I decided to, uh, that I needed to combine more voices with my own, um, as I saw that this one voice was not enough to impact the kind of change or transformation that I sought. In order to test my hypothesis, I enlisted the help of 22 friends, colleagues, and family members and conducted a series of intimate and lengthy interviews. I created a private space in order to capture their voices in a way that was as authentic as possible and invited them to share their thoughts about how their voice connected to their own identity. I noticed that, um, of course, each voice had its own unique texture and timbre, just like mine. And I took those, uh, these raw materials and I used them to create a composition a tapestry of those thoughts and feelings that were wrapped around me like a supportive network of whispering. Their openness and vulnerability compelled me to embrace my own. Against all odds, I was able to perform live on stage using a specially designed interface that was soon into a wearable garment. I can show a little... So, I can show you a little... Sorry, sorry. Um, you're gonna see in a minute. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yes, during the performance, I, I allowed these voices and confession to be a part of me because the government, um, I, I build this interface into the garment. You can see the little bits um, you can see here are uh, conductive material and I was playing the samples directly on my body. Um, they lifted up my own voice and they helped me to express the many ways that I saw and experienced myself. It was the voices were out of their bodies and placed quite physically onto my body, they mixed together to form a voice scape. In this choir of confessions and realizations, gender and identity were broken down and removed, a powerful body of voices that gave me the strength and confidence to redefine my own connection to my own voice. I just wanted to show you now like a bit of extracts of the voices I, I recorded. It was from four years old to 87 years old, and it was in three different languages because I only speak three of them. So for example, Ah, there's... J'ai chanté, mais je sens pur. For example... Oh... Bah, je chante beaucoup. Je sais que je chante faux, mais je chante beaucoup. À la maison ou quoi, ou karaoké, tu vois. J'aime bien chanter. It, it makes me smile because it was a conversation and I can see them saying this. I am difficult to understand, which I didn't realize before. Like, and I was convinced that everybody in Manchester sounds like I do. And I, I still think that most people do. Like, I'm not the only person who everyone's, who has been told to mumble all the time. I just... Well... I really sometimes struggle to listen to recordings of my voice. It's harder to, to be really like, you know, tuning in whatever you're saying and what you want to say afterwards. So it's, but when that happens, it's kind of magical, you know? And yeah, another one. I feel like I can't really rely on my voice. And uh, so those were the raw materials, and I did also a lot with the utterances of the voice when we speak, and in French we say, uh, all the time. Or in English, more like, um. um I did some voice capes. 
So I'm just going to skip it. Like, with the use of those technology tools that I talked about. Mm. I know it's very soothing, but I have to stop. <laughs> oh, more things like this. And then I would put those sentences directly on my body and combine them together to make some kind of like live collage. Oh, this one is also all the ums. <laughs> So yeah, so the thoughts I want to leave you with today is that your voice can be whatever you want it in, uh, to be in 2019. It can be blasted on a PA, it can be whispered in headphones, it can be distorted, it can be super real, it can be dry, it can be whatever. What matters is that your voice remains authentic and yours and that nobody can take that from you, nor should ask you to change it. Our voices can combine together, or they can remain private for and for us alone. However, we choose to use our voice. We have a responsibility to use it to reach new authentic eyes, hates, in our identity and to share that with those around you. To explore honest and more open connections with our own body and finally to allow a greater and more honest intimacy not just with another person but with ourselves. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much Ruth, for this very inspiring presentation. There might be a couple of questions from the audience I'm sure. Yeah, here's a question. Thank you, Ord, for your presentation. Um, I really like the idea um, uh, already when I read your abstract, but now even more um, that you're that, that you're approaching the voice uh, regarding body politics, because that's you know that's kind of missing um, talking about body politics um, uh, to consider the voice. That's a really um, nice approach, really promising. Um, uh, I, I wondered, um, at, in your conclusion, uh, you said stay authentic. Um, what is your notion of authenticity in this context of uh, voice and um, manipulating voice? But you, my voice is always authentic because it's my voice. But uh, when it's manipulated, it's you know, like how can my voice be not authentic? And <laughs> okay, so uh, for example, if I'm a singer and I'm, re I'm recording my voice and then the sound engineer would put a reverb that I don't like or would do an EQ uh, work that I don't like, then my voice is not authentic because this is not how I want it to be. Or as an artist, if I decide that, like planning to rock, a very vocal processed voice is my authentic voice, then it is their authentic voice. It's not the voice, like the voice they have when they speak is not more authentic than the voice when it's vocal processed. Okay. Yeah, there. Hi. Um, ah, I also think it's a very interesting theme, in fact, and uh, I want to just ask if it's clear that my voice changes, like with my mood, and I can also like work on my voice like I work on my walk or on my hair or, you know, I, I mean, I can, I can have lots of different voices. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, yeah, it's like a walk, and that I think is probably interesting because my walk can also be um, something that I don't realize up to a certain point where maybe somebody looks at me and says, hey, come on, walk different, so I can also change my voice. Yeah, I, I think that, I mean, we see it in the, in, the, in the performance setting, we see it very clearly with opera singer that they would, they have a bigger air capacity because they work the muscles in order to feel more 
air and there, you know. And um, also, if you're not um, happy with your voice, you can also, uh, no, happy it's a very weak way to say it, but if your voice is not matching your identity, you can also change it. Um, it can come from another person that say like, oh, it's weird how you speak, like you've got, I had this, this experience when I was studying musicology in Paris where I just started to sing in the class and this, the teacher was like, you've got to earn your voice and you speak too deep, uh, so you should speak differently and sing differently and please do it now. <laughs> So what I was doing is that I sang out of tune and I was hoping that it would never happen again, that I have to sing. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's funny speaking about voices in a, a condition like this, you know, <laughs> because if you present, uh, for instance, there was one uh, person in the last panel, he spoke so fast, I couldn't follow, I couldn't understand, you know. So of course you can use your voice in so many different things, but it's really interesting to think about, I think. <laughs> Thank you. I had a I good time. Actually, I have a question too. Okay. So you said you started like a jazz guitarist and a singer. So you have, do you have um, a lot of experience with performing probably? Um, actually, with the guitar, not as much because when you study classical guitar, you play mostly with yourself. So I had, that's actually why I came to Berlin. And also my singing practice was more in a choir okay. and I was singing on my own. And this is, I went to Berlin for this and I was like, I'm gonna stay a few months. So I'm still exploring. <laughs> um, yeah. But I, I was wondering if you, s um, if you see a connection between like the, the wish to have power over your own voice, like that's what you're doing, like you wanna decide what it is. Do you feel like there's a structural problem within sound engineering, which is obviously very male dominant to like, mm. Like a lack um, of sensitivity to sensitivity that can be very powerful, like subtleties can be very powerful. And like in a, in a room like this, it's hard to like, um, like she did it very well. Like when we were queuing, she was like very specific about mm -hmm. queuing out certain frequencies. Like, do you feel like there's a structural problem? Um, I, I don't have a lot of experience with many different sound engineers to make general comment about this, but for me it was very important to learn how these things work, to make it on my own or monitor it, or just like, instead of being like, I don't like it, just say like, I don't like it, can you boost in this thing, or you know, I don't like this reverb, it, the tail is too long, you know, just to be more specific about things. and. I've never worked with a female sound engineer, so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Is there any more? Um, yeah, I'm just gonna ask something really quickly. Um, so, not to drag it back to the market a la last discussion, but I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm wondering, so you actually brought up podcasts very briefly in relation to um, the space and the intimacy with regards to the voice. Um, I'm interested to hear if you have any thoughts on ASMR and if so, what those might be. On what, sorry? On uh, ASMR, the like, uh, Ah, oh, yeah. no, I've, I can't listen to that. So, <laughs> <laughs> my, friends, my friends tell me I should do it, but I can't listen to that because I, I don't like, I, no, I can't. No, <laughs> I get it. I but if, if some people do, like, it's great. <laughs> But if the recording of the postcard has too much of uh, tongue clipping and stuff like this, I turn it off anyway, so. Thank you so much once again, Aude. <laughs> and we have one more presenter left. Just, just one. Yeah, just one.
other side. So Katarina Rüst, you can also go to the front if you wish to, uh, is a lecturer for fashion and cultural studies at the University of Paderborn and at the University of Yards in Bremen. She studied German language and literature, museum management and cultural anthropologies with a focus on garments and youth cultures and worked as a student scientific assistant at the Institute for German Literature of the University of Hamburg and at the Altener Museum also in Hamburg. And uh, she wrote a PhD thesis with the title Fashion and Coolness in Novels and Essays in the Weimar Republic. And her research interests include literature, fashion, post-colonial studies, and pop, song, music cultures. Thank you so much. The stage is yours. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me here. And today I'd like to present a short overview of my current research. The focus of my work lies on the self-perception of female alternative rock or electro musicians from Mexico and Europe and the connection between their sound concepts and visual aesthetics. In this presentation, I'll highlight the link to the central theme of this festival, I think, persistence, by showing how female musicians from Mexico embody empowerment and resilience with their continuous performances and activism. First of all, I give you a short overview of my lecture. I've decided my presentation into three parts. I'll begin by explaining some essentials of my project, my motivation, which also means my personal involvement in the field of research, my theoretical background and my methods. Then I move on to show some uh, first results of my interviews and my so-called 4P model. And finally, I end with a short outlook of further research. So my scientific background. Two years ago, I held a lecture about women and sound at the Reeperbahn Festival in Hamburg. And I talked about my own experiences as a female musician in a band and presented some first outcomes generated by empirical analyses and interviews which I conducted with other female musicians, especially from the alternative indie scene. In that context, I've met the Mexican psych and shoegaze band Laurel Meets the Obsolete in Berlin. I talked with the guitarist and singer Lorena. Some people may question why I set the focus on Mexico and Europe, so here's the answer. Well, in the end of this interview, Lorena invited me to visit her in Ensenada, which is a city close to Tijuana, the so-called borderland near to San Diego. And uh, finally, I traveled to Mexico and several times, and beside the California cities, I also visited Guadalajara and Mexico City. And over there, I've met a lot of other musicians from the alternative experimental electro and indie scene, which is also linked to Europe and the US, because uh, the women are touring and so on. So I started to conduct interviews with them too. And after a while, my research gradually changed. On the one hand, I've extended the focus of my concept, especially the spatial term, um, it's broader and the spatial term as a fluid and dynamic concept. On the other hand, I specified it by combining various scientific angles. The theoretical background of my interdisciplinary and synesthetic work can be divided in three sections. Fashion theory, pop theory, musicology in a way, and post-colonial studies. As a fashion theorist, I'm interested in style narratives, the way how people from different cultures, background, dress, create their visual appearance and interpret it. As a cultural anthropologist, and musician, I'm not only interested in the material culture of cl clothes, but also in the material culture of sound, like gear, and the connection between these both worlds. Unlike some theorists who often interpret pop phenomena like art historians from a distance perspective, as a spectator or focus the way how the audience decode music, I switch the side to the place of encoding, the performance itself. Instead of talking about musicians as pop objects, I talk with them. I'm interested in the way how female artists and activists experience their everyday practice of creating and performing with music with their bodies and technical devices, as well as how they perceive their sound ideas and visual aesthetics. 
but it's also important to analyze the meaning of transcultural practices of styling and playing music, not only in relation to gender, but also to social contexts and spaces. That's why my research is influenced by post-colonial studies too, and of course when we think about Mexico it makes sense. In my ethnography, all these three approaches form a crucial cluster based on methods like fieldwork, oh, what happened here? Uh, observation and empirical interviews. So it's a little bit sad because there was a um, text, typography. Um, it's um, the performance of the artists are synesthetic events, uh, which the atmosphere is based on the three-dimensional texture of sound, body fashion materiality and space. In this multi-layered sphere, the women are usually confronted with many expectations, prejudice, feedbacks and interactions with organizers and audience. For example, after the hype of Girl Power and Me Too, some women got more attention and support of bookers and agencies. But in an era where borders are rebuilt and getting fixed, Authorian regimes become more and more popular. It is interesting and important to point out the durability of practices to preserve free spaces of acting. It's also interesting that in a so-called society of machismo like Mexico, in urban areas you can observe a process of founding progressive and transcultural spaces of independence and high creativity. But in that context, of course, you could, should mention that too, a development of gentrification, of course. Some see Mexican cities as the new Berlin, a place where you can follow your so-called pursuit of happiness. Many Europeans and US American bohemians and hipsters flee from their so-called restrictions in their home countries there. So we not only have a move from the south to the north, we can observe also a move from the north to the south. And many, but it's a big difference of course. And many Mexican women from the middle class naturally perceive themselves as cosmopolitics and also feminists. So you have a transcultural atmosphere there. By wearing, and uh, when we see their visual appearance, by wearing less makeup, white cut clothes in a Scandinavian style or whatever, flat shoes, they're questioning the so-called traditional gender stereotype of a woman with maybe tight dress, makeup and heels, or the cliche of the good, polite, modest, beautiful painted housewife. Instead of being quiet, they're formulating an own artistic voice with a cutting edge or making noise, establishing networks and labels and art spaces. These are some examples, like labels and um, creative networks and feminist centers and so on and so on. These practices seem to be more unusual in Mexico, as they may seem in Europe, if one takes into account the fact that many women are raised in Catholic families, for example, sharing an apartment with your boyfriend still means, in some contexts, living in sin. And many women are not influenced by religion, but also by the continuous danger and violence against women in context, maybe, for example, of the war on drugs. Although women are able to play major roles in their so-called bubble of university art and subcultural scene, or in the hipster areas in their cities, they're everyday life on the streets, um, there they experience the fact that many men are not following the instructions of female authorities. So now I come, oh that's also sad, I don't know why that happened. Mm. Now I come to the conclusion, the performance of the woman is um, characterized by four P's. I, a P, emotives. So these motives are protection, politeness, provocation, and power. Protection, uh, some female actors cover their bodies in order to draw the attention of the audience to the sound. So they try to build a symbiosis with the space around them and with their gear, so you, then in the end you have a kind of psych, yeah, psych um, effect with light and so on, so they don't want that the audience is distracted by their body. 
Others cover and protect themselves with white cards only when they're on the streets because they're afraid of sexual harassments there. The stage then is a kind of parallel universe of freedom and expression. So in their subconscious, all the women are thinking about their bodies as potential parts of attraction or provocation. So the male, the norm is the male musician um, because he doesn't have to reflect his body as much as women. So still the norm and women who are going into public and perform, they have to think about it in a way. Politeness. Politeness is a central manner of the well and good educated middle class girl who starts playing piano maybe and goes to ballet class. Politeness is associated with a calm and restrained attitude. It could also be an expression of sound, an idea of beauty and diplomatic elegance, but also a trick or a strategy in order to convince people or to get more attention and power. So it, politeness is not a weak or a passive um, agency, it could be an agency, a, a powerful agency also. And provocation. Provocation could be an effect of um, unconventional or noisy sound because uh, the cliche of a woman is more the smooth and soft and um, yeah, nice voice in a way. So there we have the connection to your topic, the voice. Women provoke who break rules and, gen and gender norms, which means in terms of music, it could be the opposite of the idea of politeness. So having a voice in general could be a provocation too. And if you think about the movie um, Roma um, currently, when we think about um, the servant, uh, the, she doesn't really have a voice. Um, she doesn't really have the option to have a, her own opinion. So it's very interesting when you see that movie um, that speaking or having an opinion is, uh, could be um, yeah, a provocation or a kind of resistance. And power, so power depends on the space and the context and it's connected to the visibility and audibility and acting. So there's a connection to your presentation too, I think. Power means having the possibility to make art, to speak out without having fear and to have a voice which is maybe not polite or, yeah, or silence. So outlook. Um, of course, I have to analyze all these interviews, make more interviews and go deeper into that topic. And um, yeah, I also want to talk with men and organizers and bookers and want to know what they think about that. And yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. Questions from the audience first. Yes, there is already a hand. Uh, thank you. Uh, I thought it was pretty interesting uh, how you went from the question of gender of, uh, to postcolonialism. Um, maybe you know uh, the sociologist Aníbal Quijano. Um, no, no. Um, he. Um, wrote about the concept of coloniality of power and for him uh, the question of gender or gender equality could not exist only as a paradox if there is uh, in the base uh, the question of race not addressed so that there is no gender equality without gender equality, uh, race equality and I was wondering in your methodology how do you do you uh, uh, address the, the post-colonialism part of, of your research? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good and important question. And I, I, to be honest, I have to figure out it still. I'm, I'm still working on it. And, um, and because it was more my, my personal network now, the woman I've met so far, and it's... Um, of course, it's a more white middle class context, so I'm it's a prob problematic fact, of course. And uh, these women have privileges in, in that society, and I'm really aware of it. And I think it's also problematic that I'm a European white woman 
going to Mexico and observing in a way. So I'm, I'm aware of that weird situation. So the idea is in the end to have um, a network and a cooperation uh, with um, colleagues and people in Guadalajara and also people who are doing this uh, place, uh, Cuerpos Palantes, and they are aware of that too. Because, I, I, because this also this kind of what we are doing here is also kind of privilege. And it's a kind of, it's ironic, but talking about other cultures is, could be a superior weird situation. And yeah. I'm, I'm pretty aware of it, and <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, um, yeah, but. Methodologically, it's really related to your topic because you, you were raising really your voice about it that how can I, we I would like I would like to, we, we should talk about it later, and, and then I write also, I note the name of this guy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, any more questions? Thanks Good. for the presentation. I think it was very interesting to um, see the um, kind of like underground scene from Mexico City. So it was nice to also connect with the different persons that you um, met there. And I was wondering if, if somehow from the perspective of your um, study on style, which comes from the fashion studies, I think, is there some observations on your side uh, regarding the quality of the sound, the music, if you can um, perhaps comment from, from that perspective. Um, I, yeah, I, that's also a part where I have to go deeper uh, into if there is maybe a local unique sound or whatever. So most of the women say they, are, they don't feel like that they're based on a certain local tradition or whatever. But when you talk, when, and when you continue talking, then you find out that there are some heritage or some roots or whatever. And yeah, but I have to also, what I've mentioned already, I have to analyze the, ho the whole material and yeah. But um, yes, one woman also told me that she started, um, that she's um, uh, doing electronic music, but she also wants to um, integrate uh, step dance. She, when she was a, a small girl, she she was doing that. And also another artist, she's um, um, sampling tapes. Uh, um, Concepcion Huerta is her name. And she's recording the voices in Mexico City and the noise and everything. And then she makes a kind of environment collage. And But also she's al also mentioning in a very subtle way um, like sexual harassment and all these things. And she, she said that, that it's very important that women speak out and women talk about it. And yeah, but it's very co a complex thing, so. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> but there's, a, there's also co a connection to the gu a guitar band. So I was talking with women who were playing guitar and women who were more into electro or experimental music. But in the end, they're connected and it's a kind of scene. So there's not a big gap between these worlds as they may seem from when you see it from the outside. Yeah. I think we have uh, one more question. Yes. Yeah. Thanks for your presentation. Um, regarding the network spaces, um, I guess you visited a few of them at least. So um, what was your experience um, when it comes to the connection to the other women? Was it more about being a woman yourself, being a woman yourself, or more about the music uh, music thing that brings the connection. It was the music music thing, and it was um, because I I've, it was Lorena, for example, and she started to make this label El Derumbe, and this label it's also there's also the connection, a subtle connection to, I would say, um, after Trump came into power, they felt a lot of people I've met they felt a lot of yeah, also angry and they wanted they they didn't want to be dependent on an American label 
and uh, El Derumbe, it's like the fall. It's a name of a street in uh, Chapala. It's a city close to Guadalajara. And um, yeah, they, they, they wanted to, they were also, ironically, they were inspired by the 90s bands like uh, Fugazi and so on. And they <laughs> said, okay, we have to do something. We have to be independent now, even if it sounds maybe a little bit romantic. But uh, there is a, a lot of energy now. I, I see it also because the people say we have to be independent and we have to resist. In a way, also Borderland Noise expresses that already, I think, in the, the title. And yeah. 